organizations. Too often we feel or we have the, ten, uh, the tendency to solve these issues within the organization on our own, where there's no real, no clear benefit to do so. I think the value of collaboration and external innovation, not considering that we own all the uh, innovation and science, but also reach out to the external world, I think is helping us to solve these complex issues. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Oscar de la Pasqua, the Director of Clinical Pharmacology at the GSK. As you know, in these challenging times for industry, especially for the pharma industry, uh, you know, to improve the process of decision making is critical. And the Innovative Medicine Initiative would like to develop new uh, ways to indeed facilitate this process of decision making, for example, using appropriate model. And this is the subject that will be addressed by Oscar, who is one of those many scientists in industry and academia who are really passionate about Diana. So, Oscar. So, um, the title is actually on purpose. I have presented it as model-based approach and decision-making in industry. And hopefully I'll give you a sense that at the moment there are two or nearly two separate entities and hopefully what we'll cover through this uh, presentation is really how we make decisions and perhaps decisions that we make uh, around R&D may have uh, further consequences down the line for those of you who are probably closer to the healthcare environment. And I like this cartoon, it's actually nearly my trademark cartoon, because it describes uncertainty and uncertainty being propagated from the very beginning of discovery all the way to healthcare. And if I want to put figures in what uncertainty is causing to our business, it's basically shown in a just fresh of the press publication by Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, showing that the success rate of phase two trials has fallen from 28% to 18% in the last two years. Now, uh, if we add that to the current stage of failure in phase three, uh, it's very clear, and I don't need to dwell on that, this business model doesn't work. So, what's behind these issues? Uh, well, the way we probably are making decisions. And, and strategically, from a business perspective, what we noticed is that there was a major wave of mergers taking place over the last decade, trying to counteract that issue of decision making. And today, you see less of that. There are not many companies left to take over. Uh, so what companies have started doing is revising their portfolio and looking for strate strategic and scientific approaches to uh, accommodate that uh, type of issues. And here I, I have an example of uh, Fabry's disease, which is a rare disease, uh, quite well defined with a known etiology, known mechanism, and even with compounds uh, which hit the target or replace that deficiency. And you would say, well, let's all do that. There are huge med medical needs in those areas so it should be easy to tackle. And I'd like just to make you aware that even in those cases where the disease is well understood and you may have a target that's extremely um, specific to the disease, you may come across a situation like this. Big, large effects. And we solve the problem, one would say. That's the result of a trial uh, where you have baseline uh, measurements for, in this particular case, pain symptoms uh, and, and signs, and the result of treatment at the end of the trial. And you say, well, bingo, we solved our problem. That's not reality. Um, that was the placebo arm. And we fail, even in those cases where there is less uh, uncertainty regarding this. So what's going on? We really need to rethink our model, not only in terms of the understanding of disease, but of the consequences of how we implement it. And my question to you is really, why do clinical trials fail? Why do they fail in this process? And I could spend two days discussing the reasons for failure, but there is definitely a series of dependencies which we are not necessarily aware of. How the choice that you make very early on on your target or pathway may actually have a knockdown effect all the way to your phase three trial. Now, the reality is that a lot of it is caused by uninformed decision making. And if we look how decisions are made throughout development, uh, there is a space for improvement. 
and I will go through some of these points with you. Uh, to do that, I'll take a, spe a step back and look down to decision theory and those guys who like writing about the subject. Why there are poor decisions? Why people don't decide uh, in the optimum way? And I think in, in pharmaceutical industry in particular, there's a conspiracy of optimism. We are all planning for success. We don't accept that this is a field where attrition is very high and we don't like uncertainty. So can we at least understand that by doing that, we are biased in our decisions and we need to stop that attitude in general. So what are the key decisions we have to avoid bias? We don't have to try to solve all problems at once, but I think there are three critical decisions in any R&D business. And if we understand that they have not done effect, we will be solving quite a lot of the problems that are consequences of those three decisions. The first one is the target selection or the pathway you decide to put your program on. Then, the choice of the molecule. And third, how you test that molecule in the context of a clinical setting. I would even dare to say in the context of a preclinical experiment. But the target, the candidate, and the dose range are the three critical decisions that we should be making with uh, the right set of uh, data, the right set of information. Now, can we do that? And again, going back to those guys who talk and discuss uh, decision theory, they say, well, when we have to handle lots of problems or lots of information, which is the case of R&D, we cannot handle that data. We cannot handle that amount of information. And what we end up doing, we end up deciding on context. What's my deadline? What's my reward? Instead of the content. And the challenge here is, how do we, in a business like that, allow managers, researchers, and stakeholders to decide on content rather than the context. I have to finish it by the end of the year or I have to finish it tomorrow and stop doing that. So here I would like to expand on and show how model-based approach may assist us with that approach. And to do that, I need to take one further step to help you follow the more technical elements of a model-based approach, which is the content. If we were able to decide on contents, how do we handle contents? Now, do you look at things because you believe? Well, I have a target, a new C CRF antagonist, that's the right target for depression. Uh, I just believe it, I have no evidence. Do you just look for evidence? And we all talk about evidence-based medicine, but how much evidence is necessary to be convincing? Or do you rely on inference? And what's the right balance between these three things? Now, what I'm going to show you is that to handle information, we need to decide w when evidence, when inference is needed. And that's where model-based approach will assist us with. There's also another element that's critical, that once we run from the ideas, from the abstraction, to real experiments, that we are actually all prisoners in Plato's caves. I'm not sure how many of you have background in philosophy, but Plato's caves, basically, you have a set of prisoners looking at the wall, you have fire over the bridge, and you look at the shadow, and if you're only looking at the shadow, that is a huge shadow, but the object causing it is quite small. Now, let's put that in the context of drug development. I may have looked at my data, but the signal you're looking at, it's not necessarily the truth. The truth might be quite different. And the, dis the discrepancies between what you see and the truth may increase with the complexity of the biological system or the setting you're working with. So I, I feel that today, a lot of stakeholders in the R&D business, probably throughout the whole uh, pharmaceutical development area, uh, deal with those three questions. What's my target? What's my molecule? What's the dose range? Dealing with those subjects as if it were those very simple issues, like choosing the color of your t-shirt when you're doing shopping. And that's not the case. These are very complex issues, and they require the appropriate uh, set of tools. And I'll try to show you that handling complex issues cannot be done by gut feeling. So, why is this a complex issue? Why is the selection of the target, the 
selection of the dose and the molecule complex issues. Simply because you don't have a situation like I have a drug and I look at the drug and then there you have your endpoint. No, this is not surgery. We need to consider there is a target and the target may drive the response. And the reality in this simplified diagram is that you have a target that engages something downstream, uh, which may be proteins, genes, phen uh, gene expression, or something else. And that something may or may not lead to what you're looking for in terms of outcome, short term and long term. Now, it's obvious from this simplified diagram that we cannot guess a priori what the intervention at the drug level look like in terms of the outcome. And, and if I go to a real biology, and just getting an example of an inflamm inflammatory cascade, it's just impossible to conceive us experimenting with all this. We need a simplified version of reality to make decisions in a timely manner. So what we're trying to do with model-based approaches is to simplify that complexity by looking at it in a systematic manner. And I will use a electricity circuit uh, as an example for uh, the purpose of analogy show you that what you're trying to do is to put the parts together and these parts could be genes receptors for physiology disease and bring them together in such a way that I describe the structure of the system I'm looking at and how that system behaves if I am implementing an experiment or experimenting with it and looking at the performance of that system including the uncertainties that you may have when dealing with it so, what can you do with models? You can do quite a lot of things that we normally try to infer from what we call best guess. But instead of doing that qualitatively, we can assign a figure to that. We can do that in a quantitative manner. Those of you working in uh, perhaps more pharmacoeconomical area know that there are models for uh, that type of um, exercise. But we can do the same with the more biological element. So, what can we do? in R&D. Knowledge management can help us understanding, first of all, what their mathematical needs are and quantify them, not only in terms of words, but putting that in a clear context and relate them to the context in which you operate, which includes the competitors, includes the commercial aspects, but also the reimbursement and healthcare aspects that we are interested in. Take into account, of course, the regulatory framework we have to operate uh, within. Now, we can put that in context and first of all learn what the drugs are doing what we call the concentration exposure response relationship we can des describe better the source of variability and take opportunity from that by designing better um, experiments now how does this look like in practice we have a series of models that will on one hand describe the role of disease on the other hand the role of drug properties and the interaction between them will form the core of that activity. But that's not enough. I can bring them together with what we call a trial model and explore different what-if scenarios to then make choices around the actual design or series of designs that will allow me to make the best choice regarding efficacy and safety. Now, probably you can notice at this stage that this is very nice and, 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 and well established, but what is quite often left outside is the decision model that is connected to all those stages. What we need in terms of knowledge management is a series of models that are describing biology, describing the context in which you operate, supporting the protocol design, but most importantly, actually looking at uh, decision criteria that support not only the uh, mathematical needs, but the expectations from payers and other stakeholders. So, have we been doing that? Can we do that? I don't have time to actually go into details, but you may have access to reference later on. We have done that in a number of cases, and one example is in, in the development of antidepressants, which um, are basically a very challenging area because of the huge placebo response you find those, in those trials. And what we have learned from applying models to antidepressant drugs and looking at the response of patients, short term, up to uh, long treatment term. What you notice is that, first of all, there is an immediate signal. The fallacy that antidepressants take long to work is not correct. It takes long to separate from placebo, but the effect of antidepressants, even the traditional ones, is quite immediate. We also learned 
how to describe individual patient profile over time, which basically told us that there is no such a thing like a typical depressive patient. They all vary dramatically from each other. And this led us to a series of publications which you can look at clinical pharmacology and therapeutics if you're interested, which basically show how we can stop being just empirical, what we call then trial and error, and apply trial simulation to help us design clinical trials in that particular field, including better interim analysis methodology to make decisions for futility, stop, go no go criteria, and improve our um, attrition rate or reduce it. We also learned that if you change the clinical scale that's currently used by psychiatrists in clinical practice, you could reduce the size of your trial by more than 50% and still get the same uh, power in, in terms of statistical design uh, so that you have less patients needed or required to come to the conclusion about your efficacy. Now, what's this all about? At the end of the day, what model this drug development is trying to do is to put the generation of data in a framework that allows you to inform how to best design experiments, but how to learn from past experiences and build confidence as you gather new data and not uh, having a situation where we start